Good morning, everybody. We want to welcome each and every one of you in the house of the Lord today, and especially those that is joining us on YouTube or any other electronic media for this divine service today. First of all, I want to invite everybody to bow with us as we seek the Lord's presence in prayer. Our loving Father in heaven, we enter into your presence through this humble prayer to worship you as our creator. We thank you for health, for trust and hope, for goodness and freedom, and especially for the gift of life. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a church on this beautiful Sabbath morning, where we share your peace with each other, knowing that we are held safely in the hands of the Almighty. Thank you, Jesus, for the promises and surety that you left with us before you ascended to heaven. Thank you for the promise that to every believer you give hope for everlasting life. You give us the power to transform our lives and align it to your will. And you give us purpose and reason for each one of us to live by, not for this life alone, but for eternity. Thank you for your presence in our lives and that through the Holy Spirit we can be conscious of our actions that is in harmony with your will. We also thank you for, your, for our consciousness of the sins in our lives and we plead for your forgiveness. And therefore we thank you for, for forgiving our sins as we ask it in Jesus' name. May those who are currently experiencing pain and hardship be aware of your presence in a special way as we face the real challenges of living in a sin-infested world. We ask you to bless Pastor Dalbok today and may your children hear, understand and animate that what we are about to receive from your word. Bless us on this Sabbath morning is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now it is time for our children's story, brought to us by Bernadette Groeveer. Do you 
wonder why bugs are good? Little Betty was walking through their vegetable garden when all of a sudden she began to scream, Ah! Bugs! Ugly, creepy bugs! They're all over the place! What's all the fuss? Her grandfather inquired. Yuck! There are so many nasty critters all over our vegetables. I'm afraid to pick any for dinner tonight. Let's just start to squash them. Ugh, yuck, bugs, bad bugs, get off me. Betty, wait. Don't hurt them. That's a praying mantis, and he's a good bug, her grandfather said, and he gently brushed the praying mantis off her. Betty asked, what do you mean a good bug? Just because it's a bug and we don't understand it or like the way it looks doesn't make it bad, he said. There are bugs that eat and kill our vegetables. I think those are bad bugs. Then there are bugs that eat and chase away those bad bugs. I think they are good bugs. In fact, I put some good bugs in the garden, so I don't have to use chemicals to chase away the bad bugs. I have an idea. Let's go on a safari. It will help you understand. Betty's grandfather then explained that she would have to use her imagination to make them very small so they could go on a safari into the world of the insects. In a flash they were there. Betty was a little frightened, but she knew it was all imaginary. What do we do now? she whispered. Just walk slowly and observe and I will explain about all the good bugs I put in the garden, he replied. Over there is that praying mantis that landed on you. He eats flies and some bad beetles. And because he is big, he has big pinchers and can give you quite a pinch. Ladybugs and other similar beetles eat little tiny aphids, mitts, and other soft-bodied bugs and their eggs. Spine soldier bugs, stink bugs, feed on all sorts of garden pests. But don't accidentally squash one of them. They really smell. Just like these, little bugs have a big job, so every one of us have a special job that we must do for Jesus, regardless of how big or small we are. There are many more, but it's getting late. We need to get back to picking vegetables for our dinner. We can go on safari to the world of the insects again tomorrow. Grandpa, that was great! Betty shrieked with joy. I now understand what you meant by good bugs. And I realize that even though they are good, they can still bite or sting. So I'll be real careful. I also learned that I must Always do my part, even though I am still small, Betty smiled. Now, boys and girls, you may wonder how you can do your part. Let me quickly share two examples from the Bible of how a little boy and a little girl did their part with even out knowing it. One day, Jesus was teaching many people about God. There were 5,000 men there and women and little children. They enjoyed the teachings of Jesus. 
so much so that no one left to eat. Jesus told the disciples to feed the people, but they also did not have any food. Then there was one small boy who had two small fishes and five loaves of bread, which he gave to Jesus. Jesus thanked God and broke them into pieces and fed every single one of them. There were even twelve baskets left. There was also a young slave girl who worked for the man named Naaman. Naaman had leprosy, and she told them about the prophet of God, who could heal him. Naaman believed her and went to the prophet where he was healed. Each one of us can do something good, even if it is only by sharing something with someone who is in need or just telling someone about God and how much He loves them. Maybe Mommy and Daddy can show you this week more ways how you can also be good. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can know that even though we are small, that we can do big things for you. Help us this week to know what is good and what is bad, and that we do your will for our lives. Amen. Goodbye, boys and girls. Have a good Sabbath. We have now the opportunity to um, honor the Lord in returning our tithes and offerings. And in this time, we realize that through the economic impact on our and the impact on our health, that a lot of our congregants are struggling financially and struggling emotionally and we want to keep them in mind as we bring an offering to assist everybody in the congregation. We have a special item today brought to us by Loretta Maritz. Shh. 
Now I want to thank Pastor Dalbok for bringing us the third presentation in a series on the Beatitudes of Christ. Thank you. Good morning, church family. A very blessed Sabbath to you all. I just want to take this opportunity of thanking you so much for your faithfulness in your tithes and offerings, even during this very difficult difficult and challenging period that we've been passing through. Many districts are struggling, but the Helderberg Basin District has been doing fairly well, and we praise God for that. I also just want to thank those who have been contributing specifically to our welfare fund. We have many families that are in need during this time, and we do thank you for your contributions. May God bless you. Our scripture reading this morning is taken once again from the book of Matthew, and this time we are reading verses 2 through 4. And he, that is Jesus, began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Speak, Lord, in stillness as we wait on thee. Hushed, each heart listening in expectancy. Speak, O blessed Master, in the sacred hour. Let us hear thy voice and feel thy touch of power. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This is part three in our series on the Beatitudes. Dear friend, I don't know about you, but I long to have God's full blessing upon my life. And that is what these Beatitudes are all about. Blessing upon every aspect of life. Secondly, I want to ensure that my character is being molded by the Holy Spirit so that I am fitted for God's kingdom. Let us remember, dear friends, that justification is my title or my ticket to heaven. That's what gets me there. But sanctification is my fitness or preparation for the kingdom of heaven. Now, friend, aren't you glad that the first beatitude is blessed are the poor in spirit? You see, it's far easier to admit that I don't have what it takes when it comes to standing before a holy God. It makes it much easier for me to reach up and grab hold of that first ring in the sequence. Aren't you glad that the first beatitude is not blessed are the pure in heart? Which one of us would be able to first grab hold of that sixth ring in the sequence of Christian virtues? No, friends, Jesus comes near to us at a place where we are able to first 
come near to him at our point of need. Spurgeon illustrates it this way. A ladder, if it is to be of any use, must have its first rung close to the ground. What use is a ladder if the first rung is way beyond where we can reach? No, we must first be brought to a place where you become poor in spirit so that Jesus can meet you there at your point of need and then you start climbing the ladder. Now last time we saw how Jesus first highlights our problem as sinful human beings and pinpoints our great need of his divine grace. Our fundamental problem is pride, self-righteousness, and self-sufficiency. We tend to be proud in spirit rather than poor in spirit. Secondly, Jesus then proceeds to give us the solution to our problem. He is calling us to humbly recognize our great need, our moral and spiritual bankruptcy, to be emptied of self and to allow him to fill us with the indwelling power of his Holy Spirit. And then thirdly, Jesus pronounces his blessing upon those who heed his counsel and his call upon their lives. They are happy and experience an inner sense of well-being because they know that they are loved and accepted by God. This leads to an acceptance of self, a good self-worth and a conquest of false pride. But best of all, they have the assurance, the absolute assurance of heaven. And I want you to note the present tense. Theirs is, not shall be, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They experience the presence of God right now because he comes to live and dwell with those who are poor in spirit. The person who remains arrogant, proud, and self-sufficient actually lives very, very far from God. Such a person does not have a very dynamic prayer life because they do not have much need. To be humble and poor in spirit is the very first mark of a person who lives close to God. They walk with God, are constantly aware of His presence, and are in vibrant communion with him. And so here's the difference. People who live far from God make much of themselves. But people who live near to God make much of Jesus. And they boast in his cross. The more you see in Jesus, my friend, the less you see in in yourself and the more you see in yourself the less you will see in Jesus and so this morning I would like to unpack the second beatitude in depth and in detail verse 4 of Matthew chapter 5 blessed are those who mourn for they will be Comforted. Now, at first glance, this seems to be a startling paradox. Mourning and sorrow seem to be the very opposite of happiness and joy, not so. But Jesus says that there is a sorrow that is blessed. And here, of course, he is speaking about spiritual mourning. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 9. The morning year brought to view is true heart 
sorrow for sin. The world says, enjoy. Enjoy your sinful lifestyle. But Jesus says, grieve. Which is a sharp denial of the world's standard and value system. But you see, once a person recognizes his own spiritual and moral bankruptcy, once he realizes his absolute spiritual poverty, his state of lostness and hopelessness, he is then able to swing and grab hold of the next ring in the sequence of Christian virtues. These people mourn their spiritual condition, and this in turn leads to repentance, a genuine heart sorrow for sin, and a willingness to turn away from that sin. When you realize that you do not have what it takes, and that you stand empty-handed before a holy God, it is not very long before you come to the place where you begin to mourn, not only over sins that you're now becoming aware of, that through spiritual blindness you didn't see before, but you also begin to mourn the righteousness that you lack in your life. Listen, I'm sure all of you have been to an evangelistic series or a revival program. You've all seen it and hopefully experienced it firsthand for yourself. The evangelist makes a call, an altar call, and people are convicted by the word of God. They've been touched as the Holy Spirit has moved upon their hearts. As they respond and come forward to surrender their lives to God, what is the atmosphere? How do people come forward at an altar call? Do they run forward shouting, Yahoo! Yes! No, of course not. When the pastor makes the call and people are coming forward, what do you see? You see tears. There's a sense of solemnity and sobriety, a sense of sadness. People are pensive. It's a moment of deep reflection. People are realizing, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I have a great need. I fall far short of your righteousness. I'm hopelessly lost, spiritually bankrupt. I was blind, but now I see, Lord, that your Son, Jesus Christ, is a great Savior. And that is why Jesus says, Blessed, blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty, and blessed are those who mourn that condition. And friends, this is not just a once-off experience. It is a daily experience. Our oh, friends, may God give us a greater awareness of our total spiritual depravity as we stand before our Maker the awesome and holy God of the universe. The Apostle Paul said, I know, not I think, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there is nothing good, nothing. When you begin to mourn your spiritual condition, it will change the way you view yourself, my friend. And it will change the way that you view other people. You will become less judgmental and more tolerant towards the weaknesses of others. 
Now, there is much trivialization of what goes under the banner of Christianity today. Biblical faith has often been reduced to mere belief in a set of doctrines. But the devil also believes certain things about Jesus and the doctrines as taught in the Bible. And he knows that they are true. Simply believing certain things, my friend, or certain doctrines will never change your life. When Jesus enters a life, he desires not only to forgive you, but to change you and transform you. He accepts you as you are, but his grace will never leave you where you are. He desires to change you, to mold you, so that your character becomes fitted for his kingdom of righteousness. Sadly, thousands accept Jesus without ever bowing to his lordship in their lives. They have an intellectual belief, but do not allow Christ to be seated on the throne of their hearts. And so we end up with a form of faith that does not lead to a change in life. And when the world despises Christianity for this, they are right to do so. There is no power in such religion, dear friends. It's religion, yes, but there's no power in it. This is not what the Bible teaches and is unworthy of the name Christian. And so what is our fundamental problem as fallen beings? Well, the opposite of those who mourn are the light-hearted, the flippant, those who are always bent on worldly pleasure. And this is due to our fundamental problem of selfishness and sin, which in turn produces guilt. Most people are content with an unexamined life. To them, sin is a trivial affair. They do not take sin seriously. But those who mourn see a loving God with an aching heart, grieving over sin and its terrible consequences. They view sin as having brought so much pain, so much suffering, so much heartache and disharmony into God's universe. Recognizing this, Christ's followers mourn their present state because it ruptures their relationship with God. Sin separates us from our God and punctures the very heart of God. But here is a group of people who mourn this condition, and there is a longing for God's forgiveness and His healing. Their conscience is quickened and they weep over their shortcomings, which put Christ on the cross. God, please be merciful to me, a sinner. With the sensitivity of the psalmist, they cry out, My sin is ever before me. Psalm 51 verse 3. And this leads them to sincere repentance, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, they turn from their sins. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. And so what is God's solution for our fundamental problem of selfishness, sin, and guilt? His solution is true 
biblical repentance. This is God's call upon the lives of his true followers. Isaiah 55 verse 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now here's how. Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God that he may abundantly pardon. Please note God's call is to forsake the old way of thinking and doing. Turn around and move in a new direction if you want to embrace all that is in Jesus Christ. And what about the New Testament? Well, let's turn to 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away or depart, say some versions, from wickedness. Turn, forsake. That's a thousand miles from merely admitting that I'm a sinner and carrying on unchanged. Jesus is calling us to a new direction, a newness of heart, a new spiritual life must be experienced. And so the call of God in both the Old and the New Testament is to turn away from and forsake deliberate, willful sin and to change our direction, which the Bible calls repentance. Unfortunately, friends, within much of evangelical Christianity today, this has been widely replaced with merely admitting that I'm a sinner and saying a prayer in which I ask God to forgive me. Friends, that turns the biblical life-changing reality of the gospel into something unrecognizable. As the great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, God has not promised to forgive one sin that you are not willing to forsake. In much of Christianity today, there are too many thoughts of cheap grace, as the great German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer put it. The man thinks himself saved, but he is not hungering and thirsting after God. Too many have accepted Jesus, but are not experiencing real spiritual life at all. And the evidence is that they do not feel poor in spirit. They do not know what it is to mourn over sin. They are not characterized by a deep hunger for righteousness. They are not merciful, and they are not pure in heart. As a result, they know very little, even when gathering in worship, of the real joy, the blessing experienced by a person who, knowing their own poverty, has discovered that they have everything, everything they need in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe some of us have been self-deceived. We have thought for years that we are true Christians, but God is bringing us to the place where we are beginning to realize our true poverty of spirit. Maybe I have reached the place where, as I carefully look at the Beatitudes, I say, Lord, if that's a Christian, that's not me. And you realize that something now needs to happen in your life. Maybe I need to truly humble myself and begin to seek Jesus with a new heart and with godly passion. 
There may be some who are feeling very discouraged at this point. But friend, this is actually a very good sign because you are beginning to realize your great need. And so let me encourage you with these words from the pen of inspiration. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 9. Whatever may have been your past experience, however discouraging your present circumstances, if you will come to Jesus just as you are, weak, helpless, and despairing, our compassionate Savior will meet you a great way off and will throw about you his arms of love and his robe of righteousness. He presents us to the Father clothed in the white raiment of his own character. He pleads before God in our behalf, saying, I have taken the sinner's place. Look not upon this wayward child, but look on me. What wonderful words of assurance, dear friend. How absolutely encouraging. Now the Bible tells us an incredible story about King Saul. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, Saul led his army into battle against the Amalekites. But he disobeyed God by taking plunder for himself and for his men. He cheated, he deceived, he stole, and then he lied to cover it up. But later he was found out. The prophet Samuel confronted him with the truth that God had revealed. And Saul had nowhere to hide. And so he confessed and he said that he was sorry. 1 Samuel 15 verse 24. He said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command. And your instructions. Now I'm sure that he had quite a long face when he said that. But then he says something else that is very revealing. I have sinned, but please come with me, Samuel, to the elders of Israel and honor me before my people. That's verse 30. Fascinating. He is a man who appears sorry, but the truth is that if he had not been caught, he would have gladly continued in what he was doing. But now that he's been caught out, his focus is not on repentance, but on damage control. There has not been a fundamental change of heart. Dear friends, true spiritual mourning comes from the heart. And that is why this becomes the key in tackling what we sometimes call habitual sin. Sins that keep recurring in a person's life. What we learn from this second beatitude is that a true Christian is not comfortable to remain in a cycle of sinning. Saying sorry and then doing the same thing again and again, month after month, year after year. Never really gaining victory and being transformed into the image of Christ. Now, friends, I am not talking about sinless perfection, but I am speaking about sanctification and transformation, which is a lifelong process 
whereby I am gaining victory over certain habitual sins in my life. But why is cyclical sinning all too common? Because we know so little about mourning over sin. We say sorry and we quickly pass on. We remain fundamentally unchanged. And so we miss God's blessing. His blessing upon our lives. Think about this. God's kindness is given to lead us to repentance, not presumption. And there's a very big difference, my friend. If a person is content to continue in cycles of sin, assuming forgiveness, but does not mourn and does not change, then he is not walking the path of true repentance. He is, in fact, walking the path of presumption. And so we need to take the Scriptures to heart, my friend, because God promises mercy and blessing to those who mourn. This spiritual mourning arises from humility and poverty of spirit. It's a matter of the heart. It's not trying to cover up like Saul. It's not damage control. It's not blowing off with a quick prayer, Lord, I'm sorry. No, there is something deeper going on here. We need to be changed, transformed, and not simply remain in the same cycle of defeat all of our lives. Now, friends, it is so important for us to realize that true spiritual mourning is always, always infused with hope. Remember Judas? He was sorry for his sin of betraying Jesus, but he did not experience true spiritual mourning. How do we know that? Because he, it gave way to despair. You see, the devil will bring you to an end of yourself where you just give up. But he will never bring you to hope in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit will also bring you to an end of yourself, but he will always, always bring you to hope in Jesus Christ. Spiritual mourning is always infused with hope because it is the kind of mourning that causes a person to look out of themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul, in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10, says that the true Christian is sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Very fascinating that these two things, sorrow and rejoicing, can be put together and juxtaposed like this. An authentic Christian experience is always a two-sided coin. The true Christian will always find himself saying, Lord, I just fall so far short. But he never ends there. Because the sorrow and mourning is always infused with hope. And that hope is based on the sufficiency of our advocate, Jesus Christ. The true Christian identifies with the Apostle Paul when he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this body of death? Of all sinners, Lord, I am the worst. But he never ends there, because spiritual mourning is infused with hope 
and says, Thanks be to God who gives me the victory through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Now finally, why do those who mourn receive a special blessing from God? Why do they experience happiness and an inner sense of well-being? Well, as we have just seen, mourning for my weaknesses, shortcomings, and sins has the signature mark of being infused with hope. Because I lay hold of the comfort that is found in my Savior and my Advocate, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, it is so important for us to understand this truth. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. They are happy and experience a deep sense of well-being because they are comforted by God himself. They have a clear conscience. They are accepted by God. Sin and guilt are removed. They receive forgiveness and salvation. And that brings inner peace and comfort to the soul. Happy and blessed are they that mourn with a godly sorrow. It leads to repentance, which brings about a deep and holy change of heart. You know, I can remember when I was ministering in East London, we had a guest speaker and we were holding a series of meetings. And there was a young lady attending and she was sitting near the front, but she would never smile. And soon we discovered, as she opened us up to us, as we got to know her, that she had had an abortion. She felt the weight of her own sins. She was miserable, deeply unhappy. There was no inner peace. She was filled with guilt. She was living under the terrible burden and guilt of her sin. And she couldn't forgive herself for what she had done. But we were able, through the help of the Holy Spirit, to assist this young lady. We helped her to discover the forgiveness as found in Christ. To discover the hope as found in Him. And Judy's life was changed, transformed. She became a new person. Only our Savior can bring comfort to the person who feels the weight of his or her own sins. Those who mourn will find a friend in the one who himself is known as the man of sorrow. And how amazing it is that the prophet Isaiah refers to Messiah as the man of sorrows. You say, but Christ had no sin. That is true. He had no reason to mourn over his own sins. But oh my friend, see him weeping over Jerusalem. See him mourning over the sins of the world. See him wrestling with temptation in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is why when you begin to mourn, you find a friend in Jesus. His mission as our Redeemer was not just to save, but to comfort those who mourn for their sins. Once again, Isaiah, the great messianic prophet, in chapter 61, verses 1 to 3, written 700 years before the time, describes the mission of the Redeemer. 
The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. To who? To the poor. That is, the poor in spirit. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, those held captive in sin, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to comfort those who mourn, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Dear friend, are you perhaps feeling downcast this morning? Are you burdened under a weight of sin and guilt? Are you living a life of despair? Well, yeah is the answer to your condition. Those who mourn will find comfort and hope in Jesus Christ. And friend, that is still true for you and for me today. How did, Je how did Jesus Christ accomplish this great mission as prophesied by Isaiah? By bearing our sins and by carrying our sorrows. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the Lord laid on him the iniquities of us all. This is how God brings comfort to the one who begins to experience spiritual mourning. The Holy Spirit comforts the person who mourns by making what Christ purchased yours. There's a beautiful statement in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, where Paul lists a catalog of devastating sins. He talks about greed. He talks about sexual immorality, idolatry, drunkenness, stealing, swindling, and slandering others. And then he says that such people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says to the congregation at Corinth, that is what some of you were. Please notice the word were. And then he says, but you have been washed, you've been cleansed, you've been sanctified by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The faith that brings us into a holy communion with Christ makes it possible, dear friend, for a person with the foulest of sins to truly say, I am forgiven, I am washed, I am cleansed, I am justified before God. I am not yet the person I should be, but praise God, I am not the person I used to be. Sanctification and the work of Christ, which has begun in this heart, will one day be completed. That is what a genuine Christian is, my friend. Sorrowful and mourning, yet rejoicing. Have you experienced that in your life, dear friend? Are you beginning to see the intentional sequence in the Beatitudes? When I become aware of my own spiritual poverty, I begin to realize that my sins are far, far more than I ever realized, that I ever thought before. The closer I come to Jesus, the more aware I become 
of my own unworthiness, and how far short I fall of his righteousness and holiness. And I realize my incredibly great need. And so I swing and I grab hold of that second ring where I mourn my condition and repent of heart. And then that enables me to swing and grab hold of the next string, a meekness of spirit, which says, Oh God, please help me to submit to your ways and to do your will. Oh friend, may that be the experience of every one of us as we seek to live in the very presence of our Savior, our Lord and our Master, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father in heaven, we didn't come to church or spend time in your word in order to skate around platitudes. We've come because we really, really want to know you and to experience the reality of a true and genuine life in Christ on which we can stake eternity. If perhaps there is anyone who feels burdened under sin and guilt this morning, dear friend, may you bring that and lay it at the feet of Jesus. Dear God, please give them comfort. Give them hope. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you and give you peace. Amen. Blessings to each and every one of you.